Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera, Om Swastiastu, Nama Budaya, Salam Kebajikan. Pertama-tama, semoga Bapak Ibu semua dalam keadaan baik dan sehat, dan juga tetap semangat ya Bapak Ibu di tengah situasi yang serba tidak menentu hari ini. Tak lupa, saya ucapkan juga buat Bapak Ibu semua, selamat berpuasa bagi yang menjalankan ibadah puasa di hari pertama ini. Uh, saya juga ucapkan uh, selamat datang kepada Bapak Ibu dari Kementerian BUMN, para Direktur Utama BUMN, serta Bapak Ibu dari Forum Human Capital Indonesia. Senang sekali kami dari Daya 5 dapat berkontribusi di dalam sesi webinar siang hari ini yang berjudul Bagaimana Pemimpin Menghadapi Krisis COVID-19. Sebelum sesi ini dimulai, guna menjaga kelancaran proses pelaksanaan sesi kali ini, saya mengingatkan kembali mengenai tata tertib dalam pelaksanaan sesi ini, Bapak-Ibu. Yang pertama, memastikan kembali Bapak-Ibu merupakan, apa namanya, memang sesi khusus ini dibuat khusus untuk Kementerian BUMN dan jajarannya direkt para Direktur Utama BUMN, serta perwakilan FACI dan Daya 5. Kami mengingatkan juga untuk audio Zoom ini dipastikan dalam keadaan mute. Lalu peserta diminta juga memastikan account Zoom-nya sama namanya dengan sesuai dengan registrasi atau dengan nama asli. Lalu Video juga harap dinyalakan. Terima kasih banyak Bapak Ibu. Semuanya sudah saya lihat sudah menyalakan video. Lalu mengenai tata tertib sesi yang berjalan uh, saat ini. Jadi untuk setiap pertanyaan mohon dapat diajukan melalui chatroom. Nanti uh, moderator juga akan memberikan kesempatan bagi Bapak Ibu mungkin sekitar 2 sampai 3 orang untuk bisa bertanya langsung kepada narasumber. Nah, caranya nanti bisa menggunakan raising hand atau uh, masukkan uh, permintaan bertanya melalui chatroom juga. Lalu yang terakhir, uh, peserta disarankan juga untuk hadir uh, sampai sesi webinar ini selesai. Demikian informasi ini saya sampaikan. Uh, untuk selanjutnya saya serahkan sesi ini kepada uh, Pak Herdi Herman. Haidi Harman, selaku Ketua Umum FACI yang akan berperan sebagai moderator pada sesi hari ini. Kepada Pak Hardi, saya persilahkan untuk melanjutkan sesi ini. Terima kasih, selamat mengikuti sesi ini Bapak-Ibu. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Baik, uh, saya sapa dulu tentu saja yang kami hormati Bapak Menteri BUMN yang seyogianya bakal hadir beliau. Namun tadi saya dapat WA dari PA-nya beliau mendadak harus hadir di rapat KSP dan hadir pada kesempatan ini yang mewakili Bapak Alek Denny di Beauty SDM dan IT Kementerian <tuh> Kemudian saya sapa juga Bapak Bapak Ibu Direktur Utama BUMN, kemudian juga para pembicara webinar dan semua hadirin yang hadir pada kesempatan ini sebagai partisan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera buat kita semua dan semangat pagi. Pagi. Kalau di Waalaikumsalam. Kalau di ruangan pagi, pagi, pagi. Baik. Ini pertama kali moderator di webinar ini. Nah, kali ini kita akan berbicara bagaimana satu krisis khususnya COVID-19 ini, tapi dibahas dari perspektif leadership. Ini, ini topik buat saya bikin bergairah. Saya jadi ingat apa zaman saya masih sangat muda sekali. Ingat waktu itu zaman SMA gitu ya. Saya suka ngobrol sama ayah saya. Ayah saya suka menasehati. Ah katanya nama saya kecilnya ha. Ah jangan cepat mengagumi seorang laki-laki sebelum datang cobaan padanya. Jadi kalau biasa-biasa aja, kemudian laki-laki baik menjadi baik, itu mah biasa. Dan nasihatnya itu menyambung lagi. 
dan jangan pernah cepat mengagumi seorang pemimpin sebelum datang krisis padanya. Itu Bapak saya ngomong. So how she handle with the crisis? Itu clue as a leader, true leader. Nah, topik ini yang mau kita bahas sekarang. So saya yakin ini menarik. Namun sebelum jauh kita bahas masalah topik ini, saya tak lupa juga menyampaikan selamat berpuasa ini hari pertama. Semoga puasa kita diterima Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Amin. Kesehatan dan senantiasa di dalam lindungannya. Amin. Dan sebelum memulai, saya ingin mengajak bapak ibu sekalian untuk menundukkan kepala sejenak untuk berdoa bersama-sama. Berdoa mulai. Terima kasih. Baik, Bapak Ibu sekalian, partisipan interaktif webinar Managing Day After Tomorrow. Ini titlenya aja kayak film-film Hollywood ini. Baik, uh, sebelum kita jauh berbicara, saya akan uh, apa sampaikan ini kurang lebih ada sesi pertama opening tadi saya sudah sampaikan nanti kiranya ada Pak Alek Deni menyampaikan keynote speakernya dari Kementerian BUMN yang menggagas ide ini kemudian langsung nanti akan diserahkan kepada tim Daya 5 yang akan melaksanakan presentasi kemudian interaktif discuss discussion itu ya dan terakhir nanti ada Q&A, beberapa pertanyaan sekaligus ada closing statement. Nah, perlu saya sampaikan juga tujuannya kurang lebih tadi seperti saya sampaikan di muka, kita akan berbicara mengenai how we deal with the crisis, gitu ya. Kita akan melihat bagaimana executive business, leadership program, dan bagaimana memetakan suatu krisis, kemudian bagaimana para leader nanti memanage krisis itu. Kurang lebih tujuan itu yang akan kita bahas pada kesempatan ini. Dan perlu disampaikan bahwa acara ini terselenggara berkat kerjasama Kementerian BUMN dengan Daya 5 dan Forum Human Capital Indonesia. Dan seyogianya ini akan dilaksanakan dalam dua batch. Batch pertama yang sekarang ini adalah dihadiri oleh para direktur utama. Dan nanti pada batch kedua, Minggu depan, Jumat 1 Mei 2020, diharapkan hadir para direktur Human Capital seluruh BUMN. Dan pada kesempatan ini, ada empat pembicara yang akan mengisi acara kita. Ada Mas Apung Sumengkar, beliau adalah CEO Daya Karsa, merupakan bagian dari grup Daya 5. Beliau sudah malang melintang di masalah transformation and leadership. Beliau seorang PhD dari University of Indonesia dan meraih MBA dari Rotterdam School of Management Erasmus University. Kemudian akan hadir bersama kita juga Mas Yui Yoga Suara, partner Daya 5. Jadi saya tanya Daya 5 itu apa sih? Daya kelas apa? Katanya adalah this leadership advisory firm. Gitu kata. Jadi yang mengadvise masalah leadership. Dan tentu saja akan hadir expert-expert yang lain, ada Mbak Caroline G. Jones, expert partner Daya 5. Mbak ini adalah ahli dari dalam People and Culture Transformation, pengalaman 25 tahun. Dia alumni uh, uh, St. Davis United Kingdom, dan founded dari Facilitator and Mindset Capabilities Division McKinsey Company. Menarik nanti kita simak. Kemudian juga akan hadir bersama kita Campbell Fawcett, expert partner Daya 5, seorang ahli, fasilitator, seorang coach, transformational, and leadership as well. Leo adalah master dari Applied Science and Social Ecology from University of Western Sydney. Leo lama malang melintang di, uh, di dunia transformasi. Baik, uh, kiranya itu prolog dari saya selaku moderator dan diawali nanti akan saya mempersilahkan Bapak Alek Deni untuk menyampaikan keynote speech. Pesan apa yang khusus datangnya dari Bapak Menteri 
kenapa kita bikin acara seperti ini? Bagaimana leadership dari menghandle satu krisis, khususnya krisis yang sedang kita hadapi, untuk sama-sama kita simak arahan dari Bapak Menteri yang akan disampaikan oleh Bapak Alek ini. Pak Alek, saya persilahkan. Terima kasih Pak Herdi. Bapak Ibu yang saya hormati, selamat siang. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat siang Pak Alex. Selamat siang, siang Pak. Pak. Seru juga ya kita ngabuburit hari pertama. <laughs> ngabuburit. <laughs> online, ngabuburit online. Selamat berpuasa untuk Bapak Ibu yang berpuasa. Mohon maaf lahir dan batin. Semoga puasa kita diterima oleh Tuhan yang maha puasa. Dan kalau yang udah mulai nggak kuat, puasanya silakan biasanya es tebu bisa memperkuat menjelang jam 6 nanti. Uh, saya diminta oleh Pak Menteri baru saja kita selesai rapim untuk menggantikan beliau menyampaikan uh, poin-poin yang menjadi alasan kita mengumpulkan Bapak Ibu CEO pada sore hari ini. Pak Menteri ada rapor KSP dan biasa Biasanya yang di ospek adalah anak baru, yang paling baru. Jadi karena saya paling baru, uh, sore ini saya di ospek untuk sampaikan pesan beliau. Ini panitia, saya share screen dari tempat saya aja ya. Boleh di-close dari sana. Baik, tadi Pak Herdi sudah sampaikan judulnya seperti film-film Hollywood nih ya, Managing Day After Tomorrow. Pada waktu kami mendiskusikan gagasan ini dengan kawan-kawan, ada beberapa pertanyaan yang muncul di kepala kita pada waktu itu. Pertanyaannya berapa lama sih pandemik ini akan berjalan, berlangsung? Kapan akan selesainya pandemik ini? Dan tidak ada satu kepastian yang bisa kita temukan jawabannya dari informasi-informasi yang kita coba cari tahu. Karena itu pertanyaan berikutnya tentu apa saja possible scenarios dari pandemik ini terhadap implikasinya kepada bisnis yang kita sedang jalankan. Jadi Barangkali nanti pertanyaan yang kedua ini kawan-kawan yang menjadi narasumber akan mencoba mengeksplor beberapa possible scenario di sana. Tentunya pertanyaan berikutnya adalah seberapa siap kita khususnya state owned company menghadapi possibility study. Karena kalau kita bicara the day after tomorrow, problemnya jangan-jangan the tomorrow is now dalam konteks ini. Nah, readiness ini penting karena ketidakpastiannya semakin tinggi pada saat kita tetap diharapkan melakukan business as usual, kita tetap diharapkan melakukan pengembangan-pengembangan sesuai dengan rencana-rencana yang sudah kita buat bersama. Karena itu, challenge berikutnya barangkali bagaimana kita mengcreate dan memaintain momentum merubah challenge menjadi opportunities sehingga kita tidak menunggu kapan pandemik ini selesai tetapi bagaimana kita surfing on it ini barangkali pertanyaan keempat yang perlu kita jawab atau kita diskusikan bersama dan tentunya karena yang sesi pertama ini yang diundang adalah para CEO di sini kita akan lihat apa yang mesti kita lakukan sebagai senior leader atau eksekutif leader di perusahaan masing-masing. Nah, Bapak-Ibu sekalian, kami dari Kementerian berharap tidak hanya terjadi one-way communication dengan uh, antara speakers dan kita, tetapi coba jadikan momen ini sebagai 
trigger awal untuk melakukan robust discussions untuk menjawab pertanyaan-pertanyaan tadi. Dan saya yakin kita tidak boleh hanya berhenti pada seminar sore hari ini. Kita tetap akan melanjutkan kajian-kajiannya karena sekali lagi kita nggak pernah tahu the day after tomorrow itu apa yang akan terjadi dan kapan terjadinya. Saya kira itu uh, poin-poin yang kami diskusikan di Kementerian dengan Pak Menteri sehingga pada hari ini kita beruntung ada kawan-kawan dari Daya Lima yang mencoba memberikan insight-nya kepada kita untuk kita diskusikan bernama. Saya kira itu yang ingin saya sampaikan. Sekali lagi, selamat berdiskusi. Semoga ini memberikan manfaat bukan hanya bagi BUMN, tetapi juga bagi bangsa dan negara kita. Terima kasih. Selamat sore. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Baik, terima kasih Pak Alek. Pesan-pesannya sudah kami tangkap dan tidak berpanjang lebar lagi. Ini hampir dua jam ke depan kita akan mulai berdiskusi dan sepenuhnya sesi ini akan saya serahkan kepada Daya Lima rangkaian-rangkaiannya mulai dari presentasi CEO Daya Karsa Pak Apung kemudian dilanjutkan oleh Mas Yuri kemudian Caroline Campbell dan kemudian nanti kita berdiskusi. Baik, selanjutnya saya persilahkan Pak Apung untuk menyampaikan paparannya sekaligus meran semua materi dari Daya Lima. Terima kasih. Ya. Terima kasih banyak uh, Pak Herdi. Uh, selamat siang Pak Alex. Saya ucapkan terima kasih banyak atas kesempatannya atas uh, kami dari Daya Lima bisa memberikan uh, opportunity untuk berbicara mengenai perspektif kami. Saya ucapkan juga uh, selamat siang dan selamat berpuasa untuk uh, teman-teman uh, CEO atau Direktur Utama uh, BUMN. Uh, saya Apung Sumengkar dari uh, Daya Karsa, bagian dari Daya Lima. Uh, hari ini mungkin uh, aku akan menjadi, kalau istilahnya konser tuh ya, aku jadi pem, pe, apa, band pembuka. <laughs> jadi untuk menjawab beberapa pertanyaan mengenai yang tadi disampaikan, uh, perihal kira-kira apa sih yang bisa terjadi uh, ke depannya uh, terkait dengan krisis COVID-19. Mungkin boleh uh, next. Uh, Pak Hos, ya. Next lagi, sekali lagi. Nah, sebelum saya um, um, melanjutkan mengenai uh, senario dari krisis gitu ya, beberapa senario, saya ingin mem- mengingatkan satu slot, satu uh, quote yang bagus saya pikir dari John F. Kennedy. Jadi kalau kita tahu yang namanya krisis itu kalau di, ditulis di bahasa China, which is basically one of the source of uh, apa namanya virus ini kan berasalnya dari Wuhan gitu ya. Nah, krisis itu sebenarnya adalah both opportunity dan juga danger in the same time. Jadi memang saat ini adalah saat yang tidak mudah buat kita, tapi uh, itu adalah opportunity juga sebenarnya di saat yang sama. Depending on how we actually see it. Dan uh, itu yang mungkin akan menjadi uh, main emphasis dari sesi hari ini, bagaimana kita sebagai leader melihat krisis ini. Nah, mungkin uh, sekedar mengingatkan saja, Sebenarnya sebelum krisis pun, kalau kita lihat dari beberapa timeline yang sudah uh, terjadi sebelumnya, sebenarnya secara ekonomi pun Indonesia itu sudah terancam. Uh, sebelum adanya COVID, kita tahu adanya perang dagang Amerika Serikat dengan China itu sebenarnya menyebabkan sedikit perlambatan pertumbuhan dari PDB Indonesia. Karena kan kita tahu China is one of our main trading partner. Uh, dan kemudian di bulan... Uh, Maret kurang lebih atau Februari COVID-19 datang ke Indonesia. Nah ini bahkan menyebabkan situasi ekonomi di Indonesia semakin tidak menentu. Jadi seperti kita tahu di akhir Maret kita ada kebijakan untuk para kantor-kantor sudah mulai memperlakukan working from home. Nah itu juga menyebabkan selain di Indonesia dari sisi global kita tahu saat ini mungkin even uh, lebih parah ya, sudah minus harga minyak dunia. Harga komoditas juga semakin tidak menentu. Dan implikasinya juga ke perbankan dan juga nilai tukar rupiah itu semakin uh, drastis. Sempat mencapai 17.000 walaupun Alhamdulillah sekarang sudah uh, kembali menguat. Next. Uh, Mas, Mas Rangga boleh di next? Ya. 
Dan uh, pemerintah juga sudah sangat aktif melakukan beberapa langkah strategis. Kita tahu ada beberapa paket stimulus fiskal dan non-fiskal, ada, member, ada pelaksanaan kartu prakerja, kemudian penurunan suku bunga, ada beberapa kebijakan kontrasiklikal, dan juga relaksasi pada pro, beberapa program pemerintah. Uh, next. Dan juga kalau kita lihat dari sisi jumlahnya, paket-paket uh, stimulus fiskal ini sangat signifikan. Boleh tolong next. Mas. Ya, Jadi kalau kita lihat uh, beberapa paket kebijakan stimulus ekonomi yang sudah dikeluarkan oleh pemerintah kita itu sangat signifikan jumlahnya. Kurang lebih hampir sepertiga atau seperempat dari uh, apa namanya uh, APBN kita. Jadi ada tiga paket kebijakan utama dan paket kebijakan yang paling besar tentunya paket kebijakan yang terakhir sekitar 405 triliun. Nah, walaupun pemerintah kita sudah banyak mengeluarkan apa namanya paket-paket stimulus ekonomi, tapi sebenarnya kita tadi yang seperti Pak Alex sudah bilang, kita semuanya tidak ada yang tahu nih. Sebenarnya apa sih yang akan terjadi ke depan? Oleh karena itu, kita mencoba untuk memformulasikan dan Uh, ini bukannya kami mencoba menggurui atau mengkuliahi gitu ya, tapi lebih ke bagaimana kami melihat uh, possibility yang mungkin terjadi ke depannya dan uh, justru kita mendapatkan input juga dari uh, dari bapak ibu kira-kira apa yang akan yang akan uh, terjadi. Boleh next. Mas Rangga boleh di next. Oke, okay. nah jadi memang ke depannya kami memperkirakan ada akan ada tiga senario perubahan yang mungkin terjadi sebagai akibat darinya COVID-19. Dan ini sebenarnya di, didasari oleh bagaimana atau seberapa cepat kita sebagai uh, masyarakat atau sebagai bangsa bisa mengatasi pandemi COVID-19. Jadi yang pertama adalah kita sebutnya situasi new normal. Uh, kami perkirakan kalau misalnya kita bisa mengatasi COVID-19 dalam waktu jangka waktu 2-3 bulan, situasi akan pulih dengan cepat dengan sendirinya, dan orang-orang akan mulai mempraktikkan dan membiasakan cara-cara baru dalam bekerja pada saat mereka nanti kembali ke kembali ke dunia kerja mereka masing-masing. Tapi, kalau misalnya ternyata senarionya itu kita butuh waktu lebih lama, let's say 4-6 bulan, atau kita mengalami kejadian sampai seperti ini sampai dengan bulan Juni atau bulan Juli atau even Agustus gitu ya itu nanti akan mulai muncul kekhawatiran atau ketidakteraturan di tengah masyarakat jadi mungkin nanti potensi akan kejadian uh, apa riot atau ketidakteraturan itu akan mulai muncul di tengah masyarakat nah itu juga kita harus memikirkan bagaimana kita bisa mulai mengatasi hal itu dari sekarang mumpung sekarang masih ada waktu dan yang ketiga Survival adalah kalau ternyata pandemi ini berlangsung sampai akhir tahun, sampai Desember. Which means that berarti korban makin banyak, kondisi semakin buruk, teman-teman eh, di dunia bisnis eh, tidak bisa mendapatkan revenue sebagaimana mestinya, sehingga mengakibatkan eh, banyak kebangkrutan di eh, dunia usaha kita. Nah ini adalah senario terburuk, dan menurut pendapat kami, kita sebagai pemimpin, kita tuh harus memang prepare for the worst, which is kita harus mempersiapkan bagaimana bisnis kita ini, bisnis BUMN terutama, bisa long last sampai nanti akhir tahun di fase survival kalau dengan asumsi masih seperti ini. Tapi juga kita harus bisa kita kita harus hope for the best. Nah, mungkin secara filosofi itu yang ingin kami sampaikan ke Bapak Ibu bagaimana kita sebagai leader we can actually prepare for the worst, survival mode atau kita hope for the best nanti pada saat kita ternyata bisa menyelesaikan masalah ini sampai bulan Juni, apa yang harus kita lakukan. Boleh di next, Mas Rangga? Ya. Nah, terkait dengan beberapa uh, indikator, bisa dibilang mungkin Bapak-Ibu sudah mulai berpikir apa nih yang membedakan new normal, kemudian dengan survival dan uh, disorder. Jadi kalau dari sisi epidemiologi indikatornya memang yang seperti saya bilang tadi pemerintah ternyata bisa mengendalikan virus ini dalam waktu 2-3 bulan dan kita bisa insya Allah mudah-mudahan semua orang berharap kita bisa 
kembali bekerja mungkin pada awal Juni 2020 atau akhir Juni 2020. Meaning kurang lebih sekitar uh, 2-3 bulan dari sekarang. Tapi tentunya tetap perlu ada kebijakan physical distancing yang, di, yang perlu dilaksanakan, tapi mungkin sedikit limited. Dan jumlah kasus kami harapkan tidak bisa, tidak jangan sampai mencapai 50 ribu. Kalau ini terjadi, uh, kami perkirakan secara ekonomi impact-nya adalah respons kebijakan itu mungkin bisa bisa mencegah kerusakan struktural pada ekonomi. Sehingga bisnis bisa kembali rebound, dan pertumbuhan PDB akan turun, uh, tapi tidak terlalu tinggi. Mungkin di kisaran angka sekitar 3-4%. Nah, dari sisi bisnis, akan ada sedikit gangguan dalam rantai pasokan atau supply chain, tapi sebagian besar bisnis akan bisa kembali bounce back dengan cara kerja baru, atau yang kita sebut new normal. Nah, ini yang mungkin kita harus pikirkan, bagaimana nanti kalau misalnya senario ini terjadi, hal-hal apa yang perlu kita rubah dari cara kerja sebelumnya, sehingga bisa kembali efektif untuk mengejar pertumbuhan ekonomi. Ini dari new normal. Mungkin boleh next, Mas Rang. Nah, yang kedua adalah senario disorder. Senario disorder ini kalau misalnya ternyata virusnya stay sampai 4-6 sampai bulan dari sekarang. Atau kita akan kembali bekerja seperti biasa di bulan Oktober atau September. Nah, kasusnya bisa akan melewati 50 ribu. Kalau kita lihat angka sekarang saja sudah sekitar 6 ribu. Nah, ini akan menyebabkan adanya kemerosotan konsumsi. Karena bayangin kita stay di dalam rumah kurang lebih 6 bulan dari sekarang. Nah, apa nih yang harus kita lakukan atau kita pikirkan agar bisnis bisa mengoptimalisasi aset dan juga ke kewajibannya? Karena udah hampir pasti kalau ini kejadian, itu akan ada banyak perusahaan yang mungkin hampir bangkrut dan juga harus memphk karyawannya. Dan juga pertumbuhan PDB kalau secara makro bisa turun hanya sekitar 0-3 persen. Dan rantai pasokan juga akan semakin terganggu, cash buffer days juga bisa jadi cuma setengah dari yang sebelumnya, karena kita ada 6 bulan tanpa aktivitas bisnis seperti biasa. Ini senario disorder. Dan kalau kita lihat senario survival, boleh tolong di next. Nah, untuk survival, ini kita akan mengalami situasi seperti ini sampai akhir tahun. Saya pikir dari Bapak-Ibu tidak ada yang mau ini terjadi, tapi possibility-nya masih, masih ada. Dan juga kita kasus corona bisa lebih sampai dari 100 ribu. Kalau ini kejadian, bisa jadi banyak impact dari sisi kebangkrutan yang semakin meluas, PHK semakin banyak, dan bahkan Ibu Sri Mulyani pun sudah menyebutkan bisa jadi pertumbuhan PDB pun minus. Nah, ini yang memang senario yang menurut kami harus dipersiapkan dari sekarang. Justru ini adalah harus harus menjadi perhatian utama kita. Kenapa kalau ini kejadian, kegiatan produksi akan terhenti, harga komoditas menurun, dan cash buffer days, kalau ini kejadian sampai akhir tahun atau 9 bulan, pasti sudah hampir pasti semua perusahaan bisa jadi uh, habis cash buffer days-nya. Nah, ini tiga senario ini yang nanti akan menjadi konteks dari diskusi selanjutnya oleh Mas Yuri, Caroline, dan juga Campbell. Bagaimana kita sebagai pemimpin harus mempersiapkan tadi survival mode, di mana nanti kalau misalnya ini terjadi, apa-apa aja yang harus dipersiapkan secara personal gitu ya, dari mulai dari kita sendiri sebagai pemimpin, Bapak Ibu sendiri sebagai pemimpin, sebagai pemimpin utama, apa yang harus dilakukan ke depannya. Nah, mungkin uh, itu dari aku, Mas Angga, bisa di next. Ya, ada poll ya, Mas Angga ya. Oke, mungkin bisa di next. Uh, ya, Kena. Nah, jadi, mungkin yang terakhir uh, sebelum ke sesinya uh, Mas Yuri, kalau boleh Bapak-Ibu, ini ada polling di depan layarnya Bapak-Ibu. Boleh minta tolong, saya juga ingin tahu input dari kami juga, kira-kira nih yang dari tiga senario tersebut, yang mana yang akan terjadi menurut Bapak-Ibu. Mungkin itu aja dari saya, dan nanti setelah selesai poll, kita bisa lanjutkan ke sesinya Mas Yuri. Terima kasih. Oke. Jadi kita bisa lihat disorder ya memang kebanyakan. Jadi di tengah-tengah dan ada beberapa yang memperkirakan di 
uh, ini juga kejadian sampai akhir tahun. Uh, Pak Alex, mungkin ini juga bisa kita jadikan uh, input ya buat uh, teman-teman di BUMN, uh, view, dan mungkin dari situ kita bisa melakukan beberapa scenario planning. dari ya. Oke, okay, masih terus berjalan sampai sekarang. Jadi memang uh, mayoritas uh, di uh, disorder ya, atau ini memang sudah banyak teman-teman, Bapak Ibu dari Direktur Utama memperkirakan ini akan kejadian sampai bulan September. Oke, okay. 64%. Oke, okay, mungkin uh, itu aja dari saya uh, sebagai konteks dan uh, silakan saya lanjutkan ke uh, Mas Yuri. Baik, terima kasih Pak Apung. Selamat siang buat semuanya, Bapak-Bapak Direktur Utama, Pak Alex Deni, Pak Herdi, dan teman-teman dari Kementerian. Menarik tadi paparan Pak Apung terhadap beberapa skenario. Cuma memang kalau kita lihat Bapak-Ibu dari sesi Pak Apung tadi, kita bisa, mungkin Bapak-Ibu juga sudah semuanya sudah memikirkan ini, bahwa memang going forward, yang saya lihat dari tiga skenario itu memang yang paling pasti adalah ketidakpastian ya uncertainty akan lebih besar. Nah, di beberapa industri mungkin bukan lagi ketidakpastian, Bapak-Ibu mungkin sudah turbulence. Hotel, pariwisata, kita tahu sudah sangat minus bahkan. Nah, karena banyak sekali juga keadaan yang berubah. Dan hitungannya mingguan, tiap minggu bisa beda-beda ya, Bapak-Ibu. Jadi kita memang harus selalu cara bagaimana menghadapi keadaan ini. Saya rasa seperti yang Pak Alex katakan, bisnis as usual, porsinya udah semakin dikit ya, Bapak-Ibu. Udah nggak bisa dijadikan patokan lagi. Mungkin uh, dari daya lima kita melihat ada tiga skenario ke depan, mungkin di beberapa industri, tempat Bapak-Ibu bisa sampai 4, 5, 6 skenario lebih. Cuma kita mengajak betul-betul dampak dari konteks itu apa sih terhadap leader, terutama top management, Bapak-Ibu sekalian, the captain of the industry, adalah bagaimana kita juga lebih nyaman dengan ketidakpastian. Nah, di sesi berikut ini, kita akan lebih eksplorasi nih, Bapak-Ibu, apa yang Bapak-Ibu sebetulnya dan bisa lakukan sebagai top management dan leader di organisasi bahan industri masing-masing. Saya di sesi ini akan bersama dengan teman-teman kami dari seberang, yaitu Caroline dan Campbell. Welcome, Caroline and Campbell. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, Caroline. Can you? So, okay, right. uh, welcome, welcome to our webinar with all the CEOs of state-owned enterprises in Indonesia. Uh, kita akan coba sharing. We'll we'll try to share, Bapak Ibu, and discuss uh, bagaimana leader bisa show up di masa krisis. Dan kebetulan, uh, our friends from Down Under, Caroline and Campbell, have a lot of credentials and expertise uh, when they are actually accompanying the CEO, C-levels, and top management around the world, how to actually handle a crisis, and how to show up as a leader in crisis. Uh, Caroline herself is not uh, a stranger, Bapak Ibu, to Indonesia. From the last couple of years, we've been uh, partnering with Caroline uh, and and a few of her colleagues as well to try to assist the top management chief executives on how uh, they can actually not only survive but thrive in in times of crisis. So the three of us will actually run this session with you, hopefully interactively. Uh, so we we try our best not to let you fall asleep in your own house, Bapak Ibu. <laughs> so I think I will I will uh, let Caroline also lead the sessions and Campbell as well, and the three of us will uh, discuss with you uh, uh, throughout the whole session. Please, Caroline, if you if you want to lead the way. Thank you, thank you, Pak Yuri. So Salamat Sori, welcome. Very special to be here and to see all of your faces. Uh, and just before we start, we'd actually like you to give, to give you a moment to get present. 
um, there's been some thoughtful and stimulating um, discussions so far and ideas presented to you. And, you know, it's hard to hold our attention for a long time. Um, by the way, do you know the most unproductive time in any 24 hours? There's been a lot of research around productivity. So the most unproductive time in any 24 hours is actually 2.58 p.m. So I think, I think you're approaching that time now. <laughs> in Australia, <laughs> we're past that time. But it's that time just before three o'clock where, you know, we go for the coffee or the, the sugar hit. Um, so we'd just like you to take a moment, please, to just feel yourself sitting on your chair and feel your feet on the ground and maybe take a deep breath and bring all your attention and energy to this moment. And think about why is the next 40, 50 minutes important to you? you know, we'll be exploring your leadership and how you can best lead your people. So this is not what your economic strategy is going to be. This is about how you will show up and care for your people. And if there's one thing I've learned in the last three years of working in Indonesia, kindness is in your DNA. And I can't think of many countries that I've worked in where I've genuinely been treated with such care and kindness and, and, I've, and how you treat each other is like that. I've been very touched by that. So, and in this time, we need all the kindness and care that we can get. So our intention, as uh, Payuri said, is to give you an opportunity to have some meaningful, ideally meaningful conversations, but at least meaningful reflections. And again, that the, the key objective today is about how can we be better? How can we be a better leader? So to take us through our objectives, and I think you touched on it, Yuri, but Cam, do you want to take us through? Yes. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you today and have a conversation with you around leading through turbulent times. We will uh, share some research and ideas with you as, long, as well as really wanting to hear from you, uh, your experiences at the moment, your perspective, and uh, continue the conversation as to how you uh, can lead better through turbulent times. So, if we look at our, uh, the slide here, we have three objectives today. The first one is to understand how leaders need to show up in a crisis. And this idea, we're very much talking about the idea of leadership presence. What comes with you when you're walking into a room? And how do you influence people? What's the leadership shadow that you cast when you come into a room? And is it having the type of influence you want in terms of leading through these times? And of course, there's also the idea in this that we're also being called to grow and to lead in different ways in this current environment because it is so different to what we've experienced in the past. Caroline. And, and yeah, the, just the self-awareness around that, but I can't emphasize enough what Cam's saying. You know, you're never not influencing. Mm. Everything you do, everything you say, um, every facial expression you have influences people. I don't know about you, but whenever I see any of our health experts or our politicians talking, I'm looking, I'm looking at their face. I'm looking to see how worried they are. You know, are they confident? Are they calm? Um, so we do want to spend some time exploring, you know, self-awareness and how you're influencing people. And then the third objective we have is exploring the barriers to creating a team of leaders around you. If you find yourself in a situation where you feel like you're the person that needs to fix this, um, that means you're going to feel quite isolated and under a lot of pressure. And so the idea is to how do you find a way to invite and really bring your team on the journey with you? And, um, you know, we know that uh, the best teams are the ones where everybody in the team holds each other accountable, leads for accountability and for results and also leads for connection and trust with each other so that you come together as a group and the current crisis at the moment is something that you're probably not going to solve individually it will require people to come together so we'll talk about how to do that and what are some of the barriers that you are maybe facing in order to um, to get that happening so if we could go to the next slide thank you 
one of the first things we do in just in terms of this idea around turning up um, we're curious about how you're finding the current business and leadership challenges you're facing at the moment and I think one of the challenges uh, you we're all facing is leading uh, and managing how you and other people are feeling this is a, a, a moment of heightened feeling for lots of people perhaps uh, in any given time and so we wanted uh, to invite you to go to the chat box which you'll find in the middle of your screen uh, down the bottom in the middle of your screen there and to write you know, three words in English if, if you could around uh, three words to describe how you're feeling right now and we will scroll through those and Carolina and I will look for some of the themes that are arising in terms of collectively how you might be feeling at the moment. So if you could just please go to the chat and uh, write down three words about how you're feeling right now and as we're doing that, uh, Caroline, I might ask you, what are, what are three words that would describe how you're feeling right now as we collect some examples? Yeah, thanks, Cam. Um, I mean, it's a real, it's, it's a number of things. I've noticed that somebody's written there anxious and I'd be lying if I didn't say sometimes I felt anxious and a little bit out of control. Um, and at the same time, I feel calm. Um, you know, I, yeah. So I would say anxious and calm. Mm. And Yuri, could I hear from you? I'm going to put you on the spot, but what would be Thank you, Campbell. Yeah. yeah. I think for me, it would, it would be like uh, uh, worried, anxious, and excited at the same time. Mm. Yes. So it's interesting, isn't it? That you can have three feelings, a seemingly sort of disparate ones where you can be feeling anxious and excited at the same time. But I think that's quite reflective of what we have heard from a lot of leaders in Australia and around the world at the moment. So Caroline, what are you seeing coming through? Uh, so a lot of consistency there. So a lot of people, uncertainty, uh, worried, um, and at the same time, optimistic, um, mm. hopeful, uh, excited to survive, hopeful, optimistic, uh, un very uncertain, cost reduction, uh, the whole range of feelings. Insecure, hopefully stay strong, breakthrough. So one of the themes that is coming through there with those feelings that they're all quite intense feelings. They're quite strong feelings, aren't they? And they're going to be one of the things that you will need to notice in terms of yourself as a leader. But also we know that great leaders are able to have an understanding and awareness of their own feelings and how that might influence how they're showing up, but also how other people around you, your teams, your stakeholders, your customers are feeling. And great leaders hold both of those things in order to bring a sense of connectivity to leading in a time like this. Yeah, I'm just reading through some more of them, being creative, worried, perplexed. And, you know, this is a, I wonder what it's like for you when you hear all of these words, because for me, there is also a sense of normalizing. I'm not the only one who's feeling insecure, challenged, optimistic, you know, actually we're all feeling the same way. Um, and so that can be a nice, a really a nice normalizing um, Thing that we do and if you're not doing some kind of exercise like this with your team we would encourage you to do that you know with all our uh, teams that we work with we will start the meeting with some version of a check-in like this which is just how you feeling you know how you feeling about what's going on what's happening um, because it allows people to bring all of who they are um, to work and it's particularly at the moment it's very helpful to allow people to talk about their feelings and thank you. Everybody is doing it. That's great. Yeah. So um, I think just overall, it sounds like there's a sense of uncertainty and a concern, but also I'm seeing challenge and optimism. Yes. Yeah, um, definitely. Thank you. So okay. around that idea of uncertainty, Caroline is now just going to take us through a little bit, uh, an understanding of a model around uncertainty to flesh that out a little bit and to help you perhaps yeah. apply it to your context and get a sense of, what leading in uncertainty can look like for you. Thank you. If we could have the next slide, please. 
So I still remember, it was a long time ago, but I remember the first time I was in a plane and we went through turbulence and I thought I was going to die. I, mean, I really, it was just terrifying, you know. And then the next time it happened, it was still not pleasant, but it was like, mm, I know this. So nowadays, whenever I do get on a plane again, you know, I still don't like turbulence, but I'm not terrified by it. You know, and the thing about what's happening at the moment is obviously we've never seen this before. Um, we've had epidemics before, but we've never seen this. This It's new. You know, you, we used to say um, you need to lead through VUCA. You know, the situation is volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. Nowadays, they talk about tuna. <laughs> you know, it's turbulent, uncertain. There's a novelty to it as well as being uh, ambiguous. It's like VUCA on steroids. And I think there are two <laughs> messages that I would um, want you to take. One is that what you did yesterday probably won't work tomorrow. You know, it's that old idea about what got us here won't get us there. Um, because leadership exists in a system, you know, and in a leadership system, you have leaders, you have followers, which is who is everyone other than you. And we have the context, all the contexts. And because the context is so different, it's, we're not able to rely on the way we did things yesterday. And the other message that I would like you to take is, and all the research that looks into leaders who have successfully taken their people through um, a war, a crisis, a political crisis or a health crisis, they, it's this idea about you need to accept the harsh reality of your current situation. So there's no shying away from it. You know, so we need to accept the reality of our current situation and retain faith in the end that you will prevail. And that's the message that that's the leadership, people leadership act to encourage your people to, you know, because we, I see leaders here and I don't know what it's like there, but we have some leaders here and certainly in some other parts of the world where they bury their head in the sand and, and they're not really accepting how the situation is, which doesn't help anyone. So we need to accept the reality and this idea of grounded optimism. You know, sometimes we can be too optimistic and we say everything's going to be fine and that's not the message that people need. It needs to be grounded. Um, but making sure that you give people that sense of hope. Hope is a key ingredient of resilience. So the more you can give people that sense of, yes, it's hard and we will prevail. And, and so critical in that is how we show up, this idea about showing up. Um, Thank you. Uh, so I'm just uh, thinking about what Caroline uh, was talking about there and um, there's a, a screenwriter in Hollywood called Woody, Woody Allen and he said 80% of success is just showing up and we had a really interesting mm. example of this in Australia uh, some of you may know that we had a terrible bushfire season earlier on this year that was a prelude to COVID-19 so we've had a pretty torrid time of it over the last six to nine months but at its peak when the bushfires were at their worst and people were losing houses and unfortunately, um, people were losing their lives. Our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, decided to go on holiday to Hawaii. And I'm sure he deserved a break because he's a hardworking person. But the impact of that on the Australian people and his absence, people were very upset and very angry and very concerned about what it meant for who was leading the country in that time. And it just really uh, showed us the importance of actually being there and, and in some respects, perhaps he didn't even have to do a lot, but being there and actually being able to be seen is an incredibly important part of leading through a crisis at the moment. And so we find ourselves in quite uncertain times. And if you look at perhaps some of the research um, from someone like Ron Heifetz, who is a Harvard professor in the US, he talks about the, uh, the difference between technical challenges and adaptive challenges. And he says technical challenges are challenges where we can apply a similar process that we've used before to solve a problem. And then we uh, have adaptive challenges where the requirement is to show up and lead in a very different way and to 
then I guess it's part of that novel sort of experience that Caroline touched around, that we haven't been in this place before and there is no blueprint about how we lead in this place yeah. in some respects. And we're really having to find a way to be different in this. And so this idea around leadership and showing up differently, part of the call for you as a leader from a personal perspective is to think about how you're showing up. And we have a quote here from a gentleman called Bill O'Brien, who is a CEO of Hanover Insurance in the US. And he says that success of an intervention depends on the interior condition of the intervener. And that really points to this idea that how you show up in terms of you and how you embody yourself, your the way you think about things, the way you are feeling, the way you see the world has a very big bearing on the result that you get. If you turn up and you are frustrated with your team, then that will have a particular impact and influence on people. If you show up with your team and you are calm and clear and decisive, that will have an impact. And so that really puts a big onus on leaders to be able to manage themselves in a way where they turn up at their best. And so what we're looking at here is uh, how is this crisis asking us to lead differently? It is going to be, uh, there is going to be times where you're going to need to lead in a different way here. And we'd like you to start reflecting on what does that look like for yourself? And this is the idea of the, the inner game of leadership rather than the outer game. The outer game is being strategic and making decisions and being results focused, which is very important. But we're also talking about the inner game which is how you manage yourself and master yourself and turn up in a way that you need to, to be able to get the best out of people around you. And so we'd like you to think about what's the version of yourself that would be most useful for you to bring forward now? Is it the empathetic self that connects and brings people together? Is it the decisive self that has a really clear vision and understanding of what we need to do and reaches out and touches people's heads and hearts and finds a way to bring people together and be inclusive? Or is it the authentic part of you that needs to be more transparent and, and tell your leaders and followers that you are worried as well, but you will find a way to get through this together? And so Caroline now is just gonna talk us through a little bit more around this idea of the authentic self and how you know yourself better and some tips and tricks to be able to start to work more with this. Thanks, Cam. Um, so if we can have the next slide, please. So this idea of being an authentic leader is not a new one. If you go to most leadership schools around the world nowadays, they talk about being an authentic leader. And one of the reasons for that is that trust indices around the world are down. We tend not to trust our leaders the way that we used to. Um, but when somebody shows up in a genuine and authentic way, it's easier to trust them. And the idea of being authentic, it's about how do you be your best self skillfully? So don't be fake. You know, don't try to be something you're not. Be yourself, be real and genuine and be skillful in that. So, but it's not always easy, particularly in these times. Now we use the iceberg model because human beings are complex things. And we use it as a simple demonstration to show you that how you behave, which we observe, is based on many things. How you behave is based on how you're feeling, what your belief systems are, you know, your values, your priorities. There's a whole lot of stuff underneath the waterline that impacts how you behave. And for you to show up being as best, the best you that you can, we need to have some mastery over the things that are driving our behavior. One of the things that happens when we're under threat, and a lot of people are feeling threatened right now, is that we don't always bring the best of who we are into the situations. So when we're under threat, it's very normal to go back to our caveman brain, if you like, and we can get into what we call fight, flight, or freeze behavior. So when we fight, we're getting angry, we're controlling, we're telling people what to do. When we flight, we're just hiding away from everybody. You know, it's too hard, just running away. 
And when we freeze, it's like little children. Have you seen a child when they're in trouble and they just stand really still, hoping that it'll all go away? It's that sense of just, I'm fine, everything's okay. So putting on, putting on the I'm fine face, but actually inside really freaking out. So fight and flight and freeze are normal responses to conflict and difficulty and threat. They're not helpful ones. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to think about some behaviors that you might have seen. But I also want you to have a think about, are there any things that you do as a leader that may trigger some of your people to do fight or flight or freeze behavior? In a little while, we're going to show you some different leadership styles. And some leadership styles can trigger fear in their people. So it's, I'd love to be able to ask you some questions. <laughs> Just, I think, I think also, Caroline, I think also yeah. adding to, to uh, your descriptions previously, that in Indonesia, I, I've encountered so much experience probably all the CEOs also can confirm this, that sometimes uh, we use our heads too much. Yeah. We think that uh, ratio is the way to go. We're trying to, to uh, anticipate or actually uh, try to conquer the crisis with our ratio and head. But sometimes we, we forget about the emotion part. In all the crisis and turbulence, our emotion is also affected. And sometimes it is actually, like Caroline says, it's leading the way for us. It's either we fight, flight, or freeze. And, and there's so many cases that we uh, uncover in Indonesia that to manage your emotion is something that is not really, uh, uh, what do you say? It's It's... Sometimes we just overlook our emotions. And thank you, Yuri. Thank you. And the problem with that is that when your emotions, if you just look at the way your brain works, when you have a strong emotion, it completely takes over your rational brain. It's actually impossible to think clearly when you're in a fight, flight or freeze or an emotional state. So one of the biggest things that leaders need to do is to, to manage this. So Caroline, before, could I just add in there? Yeah, that there is a lot of research that says emotion is contagious. Yeah. And it's contagious from the most powerful person in the room. And so you as the leader who carries the most power and you turn up and you are feeling angry or if you are feeling concerned, it will catch on to other people very quickly. And all of a sudden you have a whole team or a whole organisation of people that are very worried or very angry. And that is not a very effective place to yeah. lead from. So it is a very powerful thing for you to be able to master and to be able to manage your own feelings and turn up in a way that is productive and effective. Going back to your point, Yuri. Mm. Yep, Camel. So we'd like, thank you, Cam. So we'd like to ask you, and if we can just have the next slide for a moment, we'd like to ask you um, what fight, flight or freeze behaviors have you seen in others or done yourself? So for example, as I said before, flight can be hiding away from everyone, you know, working from home and, and not being able to be contacted. The fight is getting angry, blaming people, um, controlling. And the freeze can just be pretending everything's fine, but you, but you get a sense that it isn't fine from someone, but they're just putting on a, you know, I'm fine face. So, um, I mean, it'd be lovely if we could hear some of you talk, actually. I don't know if that's possible with the wonders of technology. Is it possible to hear from a few people? I can we'll give you a moment to reflect on um, uh, what you might have seen. So behaviours in yourself or in other people. Strong emotional behaviours. Maybe, Apung, have you noticed anything? in your dealings. I'm putting you on the spot there. <laughs> if you know. yeah, and please you, feel free to write some things up. Oh, great, some people yeah. are. So there is yeah. some coming through the chat as yeah. well, Caroline. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
I think um, I mean, at the moment, I would say, is the predominant uh, response some flight. Actually, and can you give us an example? So when, sorry, Apung. So when you say fight, what does that look like? Mm. I think so maybe what, it's more. Maybe if, if actually it's more useful if uh, one of the CEO uh, who actually answer. Maybe right. Pak Gilarsi from Post Indonesia. I think. Uh, Maybe the can the uh, committee help Pak Kilarsi to unmute, or maybe any other CEO who wants to, you know, explore, explain a bit about. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Caroline. Uh, this is very intriguing uh, questions. We have five uh, behavior we can display. Uh, but uh, before answering that, uh, I would like to uh, clarify the uh, terminology of fight. Uh, in our context, when we are seeing fight, meaning we are not giving up. But uh -huh. if I see from your questions, uh -huh. fight meaning that you express your emotional feelings, unhappy, uh, you're not pleasing the things that are uh, happening to you. Yes. Right? And accepting uh, the reality, right? But I believe what uh, our colleagues are putting down there is a kind of behavior. We will not give up. We know the situation is difficult, but let's not give up. Let's, let's display all kind of effort and uh, demonstrate our ability to really survive in these typical uh, circumstances. <clears throat> so I think, I think that's a kind of uh, feeling that I get uh, from our colleagues uh, when uh, they're writing uh, the, the word of fight there. Mm. Very helpful yeah. distinction. Thank you, thank you. That's a great There's also a few more, uh, there's a lot of fight. Um, but there's also some people saying some anger, some controlling feelings, uh, some resilience. Um, and so there are some other feeling words starting to come through on that chat as well that perhaps paint a, paint a bit of a picture around uh, how emotions are being felt at the moment and how people are reacting to the current situation. Yeah. Very interesting. The team is surprisingly open to the challenges and trying very hard to do their best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this is the awareness. If they do not align to the solutions we are trying to make, the company will suffer. Yeah. So it really, it is that the, the positive side of fight that we're talking about there. I mean, the negative side of fight is the anger and, uh, but it doesn't seem like that's happening, which is great. Fight for survival. Mm. Yeah. Could we ask them maybe what are some of the things that are, might derail your efforts and your, your abilities to be effective at the moment? Yeah. Maybe uh, uh, the host can allow, uh, I actually see pa Eddie Sukmoro uh, wrote uh, freeze uh, and then maybe it's actually uh, quite uh, significant given the other. Maybe Pa Eddie can also sure. tell a story. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the you for giving this opportunity. Uh, what I mean with freeze is as a leader, we have to make all of our uh, uh, followers or workers become very calm in order to overcome this, uh, this, uh, this uh, COVID or wh whatever you call it. And I believe that the leader should also consolidate to all of the uh, members in the company as well as uh, uh, Indonesian Railway that we consist of 30,000 uh, uh, employees so that we can stand still during this opportunity or during these uh, uh, conditions in order to face uh, the beautiful days after this. Because as I know from uh, the information that uh, after all, the first uh, business uh, that will bring up 
uh, the business has become very high is in transportations. There are many people right now stay at home and at the end of the day when everything is already uh, okay, then the transportations will uh, take place in there to take the opportunity. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to share um, any of the challenges that you're having dealing with other people's emotions? You know, are there, you know, are you noticing, are you noticing difficult emotions around you? Un not helpful emotions. Is anybody experiencing that? Caroline, while we wait for someone to reflect on that, there's a comment here from uh, R. Raymond that says um, that perhaps not everything can be fought and that we should learn to surf the adversity and yeah. find some different ways to lead in this situation. I think yeah. there's, that's an interesting comment. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we, we might move on because we are going to come after a week of freeze, it's now time to fight. Yes, I think. Oh, I say. Uh, so, Pa Harry has raised his hand. Someone's raised their hand to speak. How, how do we do? Can someone help? Pa Harry. Pa Harry, yep. Can you speak, Pa Harry? You might need to take yourself off mute. Oh, need to unmute. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi. Uh, because uh, the host uh, managed uh, us to, to speak or to mute or to unmute. Yes. So, um, um, we all here are very, uh, op has an optimist uh, uh, effort, actually, and behaviors. Uh, we, we all hope that uh, this pandemic can uh, go away uh, very soon. But uh, yet, nobody can predict um, when actually this can, can, can be totally gone, you know. Uh, we understand that China has, uh, has decreased the, 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 the people that has an uh, effect from the COVID-19. And now United States is uh, struggling. Uh, <laughs> Europe also struggling. And basically, our business also rely on uh, our friends uh, uh, outside Indonesia. So it's not only a factor uh, in, within the Indonesia. All, all our businesses are affecting globally. Uh, the demand and everything, uh, transportation, uh, airline, uh, everything, we, we, we get affected. But for sure, nobody, nobody, nobody knows um, uh, how far this can go. Yeah. And... Um, the the we understand that uh, from the minister of finance Ibuani also has been uh, mentioning about the projections about the development of the economy of Indonesia. Um, we are still optimists actually until this now, but um, but I I like to 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 remind us that we have to be prepared for the worst actually. We've been uh, revised our uh, budgeting. We've been revised our expansion planning. We've been revised our uh, projection of the uh, our financial projection. And um, what's giving from the minister and the vice minister is very clear. Uh, we need to 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 prepare for the worst. And we understand that nobody has uh, experience on this. Yeah. Nobody has experience on this and nobody can predict. So, um, yes, we put a fate on this situation. Yeah, but um, I would like to encourage also that the governments also to stimulate uh, 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 the economy inside because uh, Minister of Finance has been declared that uh, others than health, others than education, are postponed, so no, 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 and and, and if you see the the more than fifty percent, if if you look at the outside of uh, Jakarta, uh, people, all the small business, 
services uh, mainly rely on the government spending. So once the government uh, uh, stop or pause, and then and then uh, we will affect to 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 everywhere. So um, I would like to have a, to have a share from from all the speakers. Uh, what actually? Uh, yes, we optimists. Yeah, but what actually we need uh, to be prepared for the worst and how. How we do how we do this, you know. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, we don't want to lay out. Uh, I mean, lay off uh, the the employee. Yeah, but mm -hmm. uh, as we understand, some private sectors already lay out their their peoples. The contract uh, employee, mm -hmm. uh, especially, they get affected uh, mm -hmm. uh, early. Yeah, in the banking industry also, some they 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 contract uh, employee also. And yes, um, we don't have what that happened in the state-owned enterprises, but but we only a part of a stakeholders. So we would like uh, to 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 have uh, say, for example, things become worse. Not that I'm not optimist, but say, for example, we we need to have a plan A, plan B. So this is basically that that uh, we would like on this very. Um, very good uh, meetings, yeah, and we have uh, you also as a very great speakers to share with us. So I would like to, to ask what we need to do to prepare for the worst. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so, you Bahari. Um, Payiri, do you do we want to talk? Do we want to take this question now or what? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to put it, Pahari, in our issues chart. We're going to come back to you later at the end of the session because we have uh, several topics to go but to just uh, to to have a quick response on that you're right Pari. that's why we're uh, we're trying currently uh in this session to discuss with you that in times of uncertainty we really need to think ahead that's why we need to have several scenarios uh what papung has shared to us that uh this is our forecast that we've seen that Three scenarios, and probably that 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 also uh, apply to your uh, company. That's the first and foremost part. So, and then get familiar familiar with uh, uncertainty, with managing your emotions. Mm -hmm. So I will leave it. I will leave it there first, Pahari. Hopefully, we can come back to your questions later uh, after uh, this session. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it just emphasizes really how serious it is. You know, um, and and the necessity for us to be adaptive in our style. So, uh, picking up on that point, I would like to go through some of the different ways you could look at turning up as a leader in your environment at the moment. And this might go part of the way to answering some of uh, Harry's questions uh, around uh, how do you prepare for this? Because I think. Different stages of this crisis are going to call for different things from uh, from people, you know, at different times. And so, just echoing what Caroline said there around remaining adaptive is really important. And choosing quite specifically how you turn up day to day can be really important. So, if we could go to the next uh, slide, uh, I want to look at some different leadership styles that you could start to think about what might be useful for you in terms of the way that you show up and turn up and influence uh, day to day in uh, your organisations. And this work is from a gentleman called um, Daniel Goleman, who has written lots of work on leadership and emotional intelligence. But before we get into it, I think there's, um, it's just worth flagging the idea that, and particularly at the moment, there is a difference between managing people and leading people. When you think about managing people, this is about more managing transactions and managing resources and measuring outputs. And there is a very big difference between that and leading people, which is about uh, you know, capturing people's imaginations, being able to paint a picture of the future, be able to keep people motivated and, and engaged and enroll people in, in a purposeful endeavor and to find a way to really uh, speak to their hearts, to be able to have them engaged in something. And this is the idea of leadership about um, bringing people with you. It's not just enough to lead for results. How do you find a way to really bring people with you on the journey that you need to bring them on 
to be able to be successful. So I'm just going to work through a few different styles that you can look at here and starting to think about what would be, that's where you are now and what would be useful for you to be able to step into to be more effective in the time you are now and perhaps also might be useful in terms of the future um, to look at it from that perspective. So the first leadership style is the commanding style, which is um, uh, do what I tell you uh, and do it because I say so. And we had an interesting, again, interesting um, example of this in Australia over Easter, where we went into a quarantine and our Prime Minister uh, Scott Morrison said, stay at home. I don't want you to go anywhere. It's not a time to go to the beach. It's not a time to go out to dinner. It's not a time to even visit extended family. You must say, stay home. And he was very unequivocal about that. There is a challenging piece around this commanding style of leadership though, that if you overuse it, it starts to become something that really gets in the way and can derail you as a leader. So the suggestion for this is that you can't really use it more than 5% of the time, because if you do, you're not really harnessing the wisdom and experience and knowledge and energy that lies within your organisations and uh, your teams. Now, I don't know about you, but I can be told once or twice to go and do things, but if people tell me more than that, I get a little bit cranky with them. And I'm less likely to follow what they're saying because I don't feel included and involved. And so there are some inherent issues here. And I think we really believe that this crisis is something that you can't uh, take on your own shoulders because it will be very pressurising and you will get burnt out. It's not something that you can solve for yourself. You will need to bring the best minds around you together and your job will be to lead for that. Um, you can't know everything about this. So you need to harness the wisdom in the room and your organisation, and you can't just solve it from your own point of interest. You need to engage communities, stakeholders and people with you around that. So if we go to the next line in the slide, you can also look at being a visionary leader. And particularly in these times, people will want to have some sense of where they're going and why they're going there, and this idea around purpose to be really able to buy in and to engage. Come with me, um, remind ourselves of the larger purpose, to be able to paint a, a picture of the future, even though it might be uncertain. Um, and if you don't know where you need to get to, how you might get there and how you come together can also be part of that visionary idea. And this idea of mobilizing people. And to do that as a leader, you need to step into a place of humility and transparency. You need to be humble enough to say, I need you on this journey with me and please come with me and to be transparent about what you think the journey will be like. People know that it's going to be tough. So it's not a time to try and fill them with uh, falsehoods or to be overly optimistic. It's time to be optimistic, but that grounded optimism that it's going to be difficult and we all need to find a way uh, on the journey with each other. So if we go to the next uh, line again on the slide, we then have the affiliative style, which is this idea of leading for the human side of leadership. Really finding a way to build trust, to have compassion for yourself and other people on the journey. There are going to be times where this gets really tough. And sometimes we can get a little judgmental in that. But how do we be less judgmental of ourselves and less judgmental of other people and be compassionate with other people? And to really build those bonds and those connections, as Caroline said, as a as, an, as a country and as a culture, you do that very well. And I believe that's just one thing, you know, your leaders do really well. If you think about some of your political leaders or your business leaders would be able to do this piece. Um, and this is about really calling on the energy and the wisdom of other people. And how do you invite that in to be part of what you're leading? And so they can be part of this. And it requires you to be more open and to be able to see multiple perspectives. When you invite people in and to build those bonds, you will hear how they're feeling and how they're thinking. And there will be some you know, pearls of wisdom in there. And how do you remain open to that can be really powerful from that perspective. So if we then go to the next line, uh, we're looking at the democratic leader, forges consensus through participation, asking the question, what do you think? The idea that we can achieve more together than we can separately. Again, this is something you're not probably going to solve by yourself. Um, so this is an idea about how do, you, how do you have a position, a clear position of what you think is important, but hold it lightly enough to be able to hear other people's positions 
and to be able to find a way to engage in that and to be able to work from that perspective. And again, it requires you to be open and hear and to see multiple perspectives of the people around you. And then if we go to the next line, uh, there is the pace setting leader, sets high standards for performance. Do as I do, do it now. And again, that can be really important because it's about being decisive and clear and perhaps giving people smaller, more measurable and easily uh, obtained targets to be able to get to that are really tangible and clear that they can do within a week so people feel like they're engaged and they're doing things. But again, if you do the pace setting too much, people will only be able to maintain that for a certain period of time and they will get burnt out. And so again, this is something you can only probably use about 5% of the time before you will start to really wear people down and wear, out, wear energy out and you'll start to lose people in their engagement. And then if we go to the last line, there's the coaching style. And this is really about how do you develop um, and help people have their own sense of authority in this. And I think this speaks really directly to how do you invite your team to engage in this. Have people develop their own sense of authority, their skills and capabilities. So your team members and the people around you are really stepping forward into this and you are not the only authority in this. And that can be a little bit of a challenge in terms of our leadership because it can have a sense of vulnerability and giving up a little bit of the control. But actually there is a lot more energy when we come together as a group and find the synergy of working together as a group to do this. So the idea here is, I guess what we're saying is, you can't cook without a pot to cook in. And so the idea of choosing one of these uh, uh, leadership styles that may help you uh, to be able to move forward as a leader is really important. You know, what pot do you need to create to be at your best in this? Or you need to choose to be a little bit different in this. As I said before, what version of yourself would work best here to be able to lead from? And it's probably, not all of the one you're leading from at the moment. So it's going to challenge you a little bit to be able to, you know, step into that place of change yourself and to be able to work from that perspective. So again, we have some uh, questions for you around this. Yes. I hope to get a little yeah. bit of interaction with you. Yes, uh, Yuri. Yuri. Yes, Campbell. I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, trying to respond. Uh, so there's interesting questions from Pagilarsi in the chat room for yes. us. Go ahead. Uh, he said that one of the key features of leadership is actually to have the knowledge so we can provide direction to the followers. But his question will be, unfortunately, in the times of crisis as of now, most of us are in a position to answer, I don't know. So Pagilarsi would like uh, our opinion on that. Mm. It's a good question, isn't it? How do you not know what you don't know? Um, and I guess um, reflecting on that, um, I guess one of the things you could look at that um, from a personal perspective is that you, I think if you try too hard to solve that yourself, um, then it's something that's not really going to be that helpful. So my belief that somewhere within the room of people that you are sitting in, there will be some knowledge, some wisdom and some understanding about how to start to approach this. People may not have um, you know, a fixed sort of resolute idea of, you know, what this looks like, but to take some initial steps forward, the answers are with the people around you and to be able to, to step into a role as a leader to facilitate that and to not feel like you have the burden of trying to come up with something, um, you know, as a solution provider, I think really starts to bring out the wisdom of the team and to work with the, you know, the, the synergy and the energy that is there to be able to do that. Caroline, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, that? No, I, I totally agree. And I was reflecting on a leader that I'm working with at the moment who's taken a much more democratic approach than he normally would. Um, and has basically said to the whole organization, we need to work this out together. You know, as Cam said, somewhere in this organization will be the people who've got the innovative ideas. You know, it's not up to the leadership team to solve everything. Now, I don't know if that's possible in your organizations, but it is, you know, really use the people around you that will, and they, and, and this is leadership without authority. There will be some people in the organization, in your team, um, that will have ideas that you don't. So one so, of the things 
uh, we're yeah. facing at the moment in terms of leadership in Australia is that it's looking very deinstitutionalized. Leaders are responsible for lots of things, for retaining talent, for hiring people, for keeping people motivated, for getting results. And this idea of shared leadership, I think, is really important. And how do you find the person in your team that is great at keeping people engaged and give them the task to be able to step in and engage people while you look at the strategy or the person who you know, recruits really well to find the best person to look at who can be innovative in this and to be able to look at it from that perspective. Yeah. And I just before we ask the next question, I just wanted to respond to Pa Raymond's um, comment here about it, this situation really testing the leader. And you've cited there people like Lincoln and Iacocca and uh, Lee Kuan Yew. And, you know, one of the explorations we would really encourage you to do <clears throat> is what is the kind of leader you want to be? When this is over, how do you want people to talk about you? You know, in hopefully six months time, who knows? But when people are sitting around thinking, thank goodness for my leader, you know, or for the leadership team, this is what they did, this is how they behaved, you know, that old idea about begin with the end in mind, be really clear about your vision for yourself. You know, and, and, and how and what is the kind of leader that you want to be? I think one of the only things you have control over in this is how you represent yourself and how you turn up. And yeah. so thinking about, again, with the end in mind, how would you like to have represented yourself mm. in these moments of crisis? Are you a leader that rises to the top and is calm and clear, empathetic, engages people? Um, and is that something that resonates with you? And what can you start to build on that now to have that start to happen? If, so if, uh, if, if I can add also to the please. discussion, uh, Gilarsi, it's a very interesting question. I think the answer is also in Bu Judith's comments that uh, for me, I think uh, I learned that from uh, one of my uh, coaches. He said to me once that if you're a leader, you always walk in muddy waters. Mm -hmm. Because if you have all the answers or the knowledge uh, with, uh, in front of you, then you will be you will good at managing. But when you lead, you always be in shaky hands, muddy waters, and how you can have that iron wheel. And like Ibu Yudi said, agile personality to actually lead uh, a little bit more than the others. Mm. I think that's a great point, Yuri. And uh, as a leader, you may not know uh, exactly where you're going, but you have faith in that you will get there and you engage people from that perspective. And I've heard plenty of CEOs say, I don't know, uh, you know, how we're going to get there, but we will and find a way to lead from that place. So we'd like to move on because in which it speaks to another question that somebody's asked. Um, before we can choose which leadership style we want to adapt, adapt to or to use, we need to manage ourselves and our own fear and really have a reality check it's it because it's not helpful to share your fears with your direct reports but sometimes it's okay to share your fears with your colleagues um and if we if we don't acknowledge our fear our fears then they take up too much space in our head one of the ways of managing fears is to name it label it you know and and then paradoxically, it actually lessens. So if we can move to the next slide for a moment, um, and we'd love to hear from people, what is your biggest personal fear about the current situation? Now, I know that having worked in Indonesia a lot, that you, know, you don't always talk about the things that you're fearful of. Um, as in, I grew up in England, it's the same there, we, we don't, talk about some of those and in Australia and Australia, <laughs> no and in Australia. Um, but it's important to get a sense of your current reality so before we ask you the question about your leadership style would some people be willing to write down what is your biggest current fear about the situation and if anybody yeah anybody would like to to actually speak to that. 
and it is, you know, it does make us a bit vulnerable sometimes, but when we keep it silent, when we don't talk about our fear, then it has more control over us. Yeah. So, uh, Apung, has, uh, Apung in the chat has said not able to adapt, not being able to adapt. Yeah. And I think that's, a, you know, challenge. will we be up to it? And holding the pressure of feeling like you another person with the answers and that you must do that. I think yeah. would be, you know, something that would be really, you know, quite concerning, wouldn't it? And that maybe fall from grace if you don't have the answers uh, could be challenging. So thank you. Control of external factors, letting people go is a huge one. A lot of firing people, that's, yes. that's just, yeah, that's huge. And I think that speaks to the humanity of the situation, doesn't it? That it's very difficult to do that in a really difficult environment, as Pa Henry said, you know, uh, you know, uh, staff, having to let go of staff is challenging. Yes, um, yes. laying off people, uh, the chaos of the situation. Uh, not being ready for the worst. Yeah. And yeah. so firing people is coming up a lot, having to let people go, yeah. having had to disappoint people or know the hardships that will be created in this. Yeah, mm. and that is a that is a big piece of people leadership, I think, Caroline, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, yes. I'm just I'm, get, I'm getting sucked into the um, <laughs> to the. It's just so meaningful what people are saying. Yeah. So please keep writing those um, because then we'd like to have it so that the idea with with dealing with your emotions is the first to be agile with your emotions the first thing is to recognize it and label it it's an old psychological technique for resilience is label the fear yeah um because it has less control over us when we do that and then the next thing we'd like to invite you to do and i think we'll do a poll with this cam so if we could go to the second question on the slide um, how, uh, so this is looking at it from a slightly different perspective. So not so much what you think you need to show up is, but if you ask yourself the question, how do your people need you to show up and what leadership style are they looking for? So really flipping this on its head and saying, this is about really meeting people where they are and bringing them along on the journey. And the best leaders that I know are the ones that do this. You know, you have often have two different types of leaders. One that meet people where they are, wherever that may be, and bring them along on the journey, and that the ones that are frustrated that people aren't where they need to be. But often a leader's job is to be able to meet people where they are and to really capture uh, what's important to them and to meet them in that place from a leadership style and bring them along the journey. So we've launched the poll. Please go in and just think about how do your people need you to show up? And we can have a look at it from that perspective. And so we can see as we move through the poll, we've got around 30 people out of 141 at the moment. Um, we have uh, commanding 32%, visionary 30%, affiliative 16, democratic around the 13%. No one for pay setting at the moment. That doesn't seem to be something that, um, and perhaps that's because the pace of things at the moment is already quite quick. Um, we've got a little bit on that now. The visionary seems to be one of the things that's coming up there. How do you yeah. mobilise people towards a vision? Come with me. And I think that very much speaks to, you know, the job of a leader is to bring people on, on the journey with them and to engage with them and to really find a way to create the connection and the trust. I saw that come up in the chat. Someone said, you know, trust is one of the most important things here. And, Absolutely. How do you find a way to build trust in these times where it's really going to be tested? And how do you still maintain trust when people know that there might be a restructure or you might need to let people go or to fire them and to be as, um, you know, as transparent as you can with people uh, as you move through on the journey? So we've got about half people are responding now. Again, visionary seems to be uh, quite strong yeah. there. And the, yeah. the idea of purpose. Caroline? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, yeah, 
in times of uncertainty, people need something to hold on to. Mm -hmm. So however you need to create that sense of vision and what are we focusing on and what's it going to look like when we're through this um, gives people some sense of certainty. Yes. And if you think about what your need is from your leaders, I imagine part of that is what's, what's the direction? Where are we heading in? What does this look like? You know, and I think it's a very powerful position as a leader. People will want to know what's important to you and where you think it's possible for this to go. And even in situations where you might not know exactly what that looks like, again, you can talk about the how can we get there? What does this look like when we come together as a team that acts really well together? We do create trust. We are candid with our feelings. We find a way to manage ourselves in a way where, uh, you know, we're happy with how we're representing ourselves. There's one way of looking at that. I'm also reminded of the, the research from London Business School a while ago that looked at what do followers look for? And this, is, this isn't in turbulent times, but you know, one of the things, or a couple of the things that followers, they look for community. You know, they look for that sense of belonging. And again, as much as possible for you as leaders to create that sense of, you know, we're all, we are all in this together. Mm. Um, and they look for authenticity. You know, they mm. want you to be real, to show up and be real as we've talked about. And I think sometimes that can be a challenge for a leader because it creates some vulnerability. Because if you're not sure exactly where this is heading, people will know that if you're making it up and the challenge around being vulnerable and authentic in this space is to actually be able to say, there are some things that I know here and that are clear and other things that are still emerging. And it's our job as a team of leaders to work on what's emerging. And this is something that we don't exactly know where it's heading. And, that it, being transparent in that way is a form of leadership. It's, you don't have to be the expert or the knowledge, uh, the knowledgeable person all the time. Um, and it may be a bit of a change for the people around you, um, but I think people appreciate that sense of being candid and being authentic and transparent as much as you as the expert from the space. And again, it might be a little bit of a switch for you. So have we got the final results from the poll? Um, we're uh, still about two thirds of the way through, but I think we've got a pretty good I indication that got... visionary, followed by commanding, yep. followed by affiliative, and then democratic. So there is something about setting the vision, yep. um, being clear with people, but also building those bonds and connections with each other. And that's something to keep thinking about as the situation emerges. I'm also noticing there that people have um, answered the third question as well, the barriers to creating a team uh, around you. Yeah, so if we just quickly look at that, what are the barriers to creating a, a team of leaders around you? And I think there's one more line on that slide if yeah. you uh, maybe click again. Um, but one of the things we know from the research is that um, poorly performing teams, uh, no one takes accountability for um, actions and results. In um, moderately performing teams, the leader is accountable for making sure that uh, the organisation gets results. But in high performing teams, the whole team takes accountability for um, the results that the people are getting. And so just thinking about where you're up to in that and what might be some of the barriers around calling your team forward into this um, that might um, make it difficult for you as a change of pace in terms of the way you're leading. So, Caroline, what are you seeing in the chat? Um, um, uncertainty, economic turbulence, uncertain environment that we don't know when it's going to end. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Low yeah. motivation due to anxiety. Again, helpful to acknowledge that in people, to acknowledge that anxiety is normal. You know, you are people are having normal a normal reaction to a unnormal situation. Mm. So I am I am just mindful that we wanted to to leave some time for your questions and to hear from the other panel. So maybe in in summary, if we can just um, bring our part to close and then and then respond to your questions and hear from some of you. So we've talked about showing up differently, showing up better. Um, how do you want to be to support your people in this time? And we've given you some, some uh, options and suggestions there. And so we want to close, if we can have the last slide, please, with this idea, if we bring it all together, 
of what we call the five C's. So these are some important things to focus on. And we have mentioned most of them already. Calm, whatever, whatever the internal practices that you have to help you to stay calm. You know, I know that when I'm having a busy day, I set my phone alarm every hour. I stop for two minutes. I go for a walk. I take some deep breaths. I stretch. I just, you know, whatever you do, but find ways of stay, staying calm. Find a calm friend to debrief with. You know, if you're really, if you're not having a good day, don't talk to somebody who's not calm, you know, so calm is incredibly important. The confidence, be confident in who you are. You can do this because you can do this and you will do this. Um, confidence in what you say and the decisions that you make. People want to see confidence in their leaders. Clarity, you know, in, in times of change, human beings want three things. They want information. They want a sense of the next steps. What do I need to do today? And they want care. So being as clear as you can, even if you don't know the exact answer, but you know, providing clarity in that and care. And then of course, consistency. Know your vision and your values and be real and authentic. So we will pause there and take some of your questions. Uh, Trima Garci for your time. Um, I think the last thing I'd wanna say is one of the things I've noticed in these Zoom calls around the world is that there's a, there's a closeness that I hadn't anticipated. I hadn't anticipated that I could talk to a hundred and however many people it is and actually have that sense of connection and closeness. And I think your challenges are a lot harder than our challenges here in Australia. Um, but we really want to know that we're here, you know, and we are in this together and any way that we can support you, even if it's just, I don't know, a chat or something that, that we're here and we care and we're looking forward to getting on a plane and coming to see you sometime soon. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. So we'll pause and let's see, uh, Yuri, do we have, we have some time for some questions? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to leave. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Caroline and also Campbell. Bapak-bapak uh, dan Ibu memang pasti banyak sekali yang harus didiskusikan. Dan mungkin ini kita memang baru mulai. Mudah-mudahan mulai berpikir tentang teaser, tentang bagaimana kita harus think ahead. Business is not usual. It's very useful to have a scenario planning. Dan yang paling penting semua ketidakjelasan ini, bagaimana kita memanage emosi. Sebagai leader yang akan dilihat dan akan betul-betul dirasakan energinya ke seluruh uh, karyawan. Uh, jadi bukan hanya rasio. Nah, saya mungkin balik, saya uh, membalikan sesinya ke Pak Herdi sebagai moderator untuk uh, sesi question and answers. Silakan Pak Herdi. Baik, terima kasih Mas Yuri. Uh, Bapak, Ibu sekalian, Uh, kita masih membuka kesempatan untuk bertanya langsung. Sekiranya masih ada yang ingin disampaikan, menarik memang topiknya. Cuma memang by conference memang jadi susah untuk ini ya. Tapi anyway, let's try. Ada ada yang ingin disampaikan barangkali? Is there any further question from the participant? Jadi tampaknya Pak Herdi ada Pak Wahyu. Pak Wahyu yang raise hands. Oh, Pak Wahyu. Pak Wahyu, Pak Wahyu. Pak Wahyu, tadi ada yang mau ditanyakan? Pak Edi, Pak Edi, raise hand, Pak Edi. Pak Edi, Pak Edi Setiono, Pak Edi... Pak Edi Sukmoro. Kai, Pak. Oh, Pak Edi, Kai. Silakan, Pak Edi. Ya, Pak Edi, barangkali ini Bahasa Indonesia biar lancar. Mohon ya, Indonesia pencerahan aja. saja, ya, pencerahan saja. Dari referensi yang saya dapat, Manakala penanganan COVID-19 ini 
yang tersembuhkan sudah melebihi dari yang meninggal, itu infonya ini akan segera menurun. Apakah betul melalui pengalaman-pengalaman dari bapak-bapak yang ada di situ? Itu saja pertanyaan saya. Sekarang Indonesia sudah yang sembuh itu melebihi yang meninggal. Itu saja Pak Edi. Ya, makasih. Pak Yuri. Hey, Pak. We need to respond directly or can he have just some more question or? I think okay. kita bisa some more question dulu Pak, nanti kita kita apa, jawab. Oke, okay. next. Mungkin yang kedua itu Pak Hari yang tadi kan belum belum tuntas juga ya. So what we should prepare for the worst then? Itu itu sempat tadi ditanya saya catat tapi belum terjawab secara oke. Okay. So how should we prepare for the worst katanya? Yang belum dieksplor lebih lanjut uh, tanggapannya dari Pak Hari. Itu ya. Tadi saya tangkap dari saat sesi sebelumnya. Baik, baik Pak. Baik, kita coba jawab dulu dua itu, Pak. Baik, uh, Pak, pertanyaan Pak Edi, yang sembuh sudah semakin, so everyone's getting recover or increase, dan sebaliknya yang pass away, mulai decline, this is indication for getting better or not. So silakan Pak Yuri or Caroline or Campbell. Ya, yeah. Uh, I think Pak Apung, Caroline, and Campbell, there's a question from Pak Edi that uh, regarding the COVID-19. So in Indonesia, the the data the data currently is that the hill uh, people that there is uh, uh, already recover from COVID-19, the statistic shows that it is a greater number than the death toll. Uh, is that a sign of getting better? Is are we flattening the curve? I think my my for me I think I'm I'm going to probably try to answer first Pak Edi. I think it it creates a hope Pak hopefully uh, I really would like to think that way but unfortunately I think it all depends on the data. And for example like I I don't think we have reached a uh, a critical point of data that we can say that we already flattened the curve or conquer the virus. So I'm still hopeful, Pak Edi, but uh, if we reach a sizable number, probably, I think that will be more informative rather than uh, still currently, uh, in the current number. Pak Pung, do you have any... Actually, I want to add on, probably, Pak. So, Pak Edi, I think, unfortunately, our current infrastructure in Indonesia, we are still not be able to... Like it, mungkin saya pakai bahasa aja kali ya, Pak, ya, supaya lebih gampang. Jadi, kita tuh belum, uh, belum bisa meng memperkirakan sebenarnya berapa jumlah orang yang kena virus COVID-19 di Indonesia. Karena secara reality, kapasitas dari lab di Indonesia untuk mem- mengetes jumlah penderita COVID-19 itu saat ini hanya seribu Pak per hari. Which is sangat jauh di bawah ideal dari yang seharusnya. Tapi, uh, mengemphasize dari uh, ininya Mas Yuri, yes, there's hope. Tapi, unfortunately, I don't think we can comment whether we're able to flatten the curve atau belum. Dan itu yang pertama, Pak. Yang kedua, kalau kita lihat even di Wuhan, China gitu ya, Pak, uh, itu sudah turun, tapi sekarang banyak kasus-kasus baru lagi yang naik, uh, apa yang bermunculan. Nah, jadi implikasinya buat kita second sebagai wave. pemimpin, ya second wave. Nah, implikasinya sebagai kita pemimpin bisnis sebenarnya sih, dan mungkin ini juga nanti bisa kita coba diskusikan dengan uh, expert dari kalangan medis, uh, kepastian Corona atau COVID-19 ini akan bisa diatasi adalah kalau uh, ada vaksin, Pak. Karena kalau kita lihat virusnya ini bisa dibilang uh, apa namanya uh, banyak mutasinya. Jadi even kalaupun turun bisa jadi naik lagi gitu. Nah itulah kenapa sebenarnya mungkin juga saya boleh nyambung nanti uh, Caroline atau Campbell, if you have addition please uh, feel free. But answering the second questions on apa namanya preparing for the worst. I think uh, if we want to put it as a philosophy, we need to basically rethink that you know. Imagine in the next one year, your business is basically will not have any revenue, profit or whatsoever. So what are the things that you can do 
in order to increase your cash flow. Ini kalau saya, sorry saya berbicara dari sisi outer ya tadi ya, dari sisi strategi. What are the things that you need to actually do in order to increase your cash flow atau cadangan kas? Bisa dari sweating your assets, maksudnya dari aset-aset yang Bapak Ibu punya sekarang, apa nih yang bisa diutilize, atau Bapak cari new business opportunities dari sisi revenue, misalnya tadinya Bapak, uh, let's say di kereta api gitu ya, karena sekarang uh, transportasi orang manusia tidak 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 hampir relatif tidak ada, bagaimana Bapak bisa men-switch mungkin lebih ke logistik untuk memastikan keperluan bahan baku, segala macam itu uh, terjadi. Jadi banyak sekali uh, apa namanya new business opportunities yang mungkin harus dipikirkan pada saat uh, situasi krisis ini berlangsung. Jadi butuh kreativitas juga Pak. Mungkin uh, itu dan selain uh, revenue, cost juga harus kita manage. People uh, yang paling penting bagaimana kita bisa memastikan kalau people kita itu juga masih termotivasi untuk bekerja dan yang terakhir adalah pendukung infrastruktur pendukungnya juga harus kita pikirkan apakah nanti pada saat misalnya kita bekerja kembali apakah kita sudah memiliki infrastruktur pendukung yang pas untuk menjalankan bisnis kita mungkin dari aku begitu Mas Yuri yang Caroline mungkin kalau dari saya mungkin dari sisi people-nya ya Pak tadi prepare for the worst kan meaning antisipasi Seperti yang kami coba paparkan, Pak, let's try to think ahead, think again, and think across. Karena kita nggak bisa just do, Pak. Karena what we did yesterday probably nggak relevan lagi ke depan. Jadi we need to think ahead, think again, and think across, and be agile. Kita update informasinya mungkin per hari atau per minggu, Pak, karena ada inf- apa, informasi selalu berubah. We need to be agile, and then, dan itu butuh kita memprepare our emotion untuk lebih calm, Pak. Karena akan gampang sekali untuk panik. Gampang sekali untuk mengatakan bahwa, oke, okay, this is too much for me, I'm gonna get out. Cuma saya rasa begitu itu sudah tenang, Bapak melihat skenario ke depan, dengan thinking again, thinking ahead, thinking across, mungkin ada jadi beberapa skenario, jadi kita bisa antisipasi, Pak. Saya menarik nih, Pak, karena saya mengikuti perdebatan Trump dan Gubernur Cuomo di New York. Ada pertanyaan dari salah satu uh, reporter te- ke Gubernur Cuomo. Dia bilang, what's the worst that can happen to the economy? Hmm. Kalau Gubernur Cuomo bilang, ya, Pak, the worst, prepare for the worst, meaning preparing for death. Death betul-betul kematian, karena ini bukan hanya ekonomi, tapi ini juga krisis uh, betul-betul ya pandemi. Yang kalau kita betul-betul mau prepare for the worst, Pak, adalah prepare for death tadi. Nah, karena itu, Bagaimana kita bisa uh, punya lebih mental health untuk lebih tenang melihat kira-kira skenario ke depan apa yang masih bisa kita lakukan. Saya percaya dengan spirit bapak-bapak tadi ibu bapak ibu semua mengatakan fight, grounded optimism. I think balik lagi dan mungkin nggak bisa sendiri ya pak harus bisa harus harus bekerja sama dengan orang lain. I think I believe we can we can overcome this crisis. Caroline and Campbell, Caroline yeah. and Campbell, would you like to uh, say something about preparing for the worst? Um, What does it take to prepare for the worst as a leader? To the other one, I'm not a medical medical expert, so I can't give you an indication of whether you flatten the curve. But I can speak from experience in Australia, where um, we're really only finding out maybe two weeks later how we were two weeks before, and I think. From a leadership perspective, this is really um, the area of ambiguity. We don't really know, and the experts don't even really know where we're up to until it's passed and we're a couple of weeks down the track. So from a leadership perspective, I think one of the things you can do is to have um, meaningful conversations with the people around you to ask them how they are going and what is... like for them around with this sense of ambiguity, not knowing whether the worst has passed or the worst is still to come. And so not just having business conversations, but to actually have those meaningful conversations with people and ask them how they are, especially if people are working from home, which has an increased sense of isolation to it, where people may feel like they're alone or they don't, you know, have people to speak to. So I think it's important to go beyond business conversations and have conversations with people 
to help them process where this is up to. And as a leader, this is really the, you know, the piece around working with ambiguity. We don't know and we won't know. And so I would echo Yuri's thoughts there around how do you be as present as you can and be as agile as you can in the moment, being prepared to move, to pivot, to change and have um, maybe some a few different scenarios that you think might play out and have them planned. And so you have a bit of a straw man or a skeleton about what you might do. Um, but it's an emerging you know, future. We don't know what's going to happen. And so it really draws on you as a leader to be able to be present, to manage your feelings, to help other people manage theirs and to put yourself in the best possible place to make the best decisions you can to be able to, to navigate this as a leader. And the only thing that I would add there is that, you know, psychologically, from a very personal perspective, it can be difficult and helpful to face into our fear. Like, what is the worst that could happen for us? And again, when we can do that, I mean, and it, it's a horrible thing to do, you know, and we, it can make us cry and, you know, it's a horrible thing to do, but it, it doesn't have so much power over us. Our fears don't have so much power over us when we can just face into them. And I'm sure a lot of people on this call have had really difficult times in, in, in your life, you know, so you know how to get over difficult times. You know, resilience is something that, we learn through experience. You've all had times when, you know, the, your world's come crashing down in some way and you've got through it and you will get through this and you'll be different and the world will be different. But, but somehow facing into our fears is, is hard and it's important because you, yeah, anyway, it's, it's, and you're not, you're not doing it alone. I think one of the things that Australian leaders are talking about a lot at the moment is loss that they've lost their normal way of being, the normal things they do, the normal way they interact with their teams, the normal way of business. And so there is quite a bit of sort of processing around, I've lost what I had and what I knew how to do, and I'm faced with a future that's quite uncertain. And so, again, people have been talking about this with each other. And I think one of the hardest things to do as a human being is to watch somebody else suffer. But I really hear that in your culture you do that incredibly well so i would call up the resources of how you know how to be with each other and how to be present with each other and to console each other and to listen to each other and i think people at the base have just three very basic human needs we want to be heard we want to feel understood and we want to be spoken to honestly and as a leader if you just do those three things that will count for a lot in terms of how your people feel led and how they feel connected to you and how you help reduce a little bit of that ambiguity and not knowing for them is to feel heard and to feel validated by somebody, especially a leader. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Halo, masih ada tanggapan lain? Ya. Tadi ada yang menyampaikan? Ada pertanyaan dari Pak Gusti, saya buka. Terputra, Pak. Pak Gusti. Okay. Ya. Ya, selamat sore Bapak-Bapak semuanya. Sore, Bapak. Selamat sore, Pak. Selamat sore, Pak. Ya. Kami ini dari sektor konstruksi, yang seluruh pekerjaannya harus diselesaikan oleh langsung oleh pekerja. Sehingga tidak mungkin bisnis konstruksi ini disipting. Nah, kondisi sekarang ini adalah kondisi yang luar biasa dan belum pernah kita hadapi. Yang paling penting adalah bagaimana, pertanyaan saya, untuk mengoptimalkan motivasi karyawan sehingga bisa karyawan itu bekerja paling tidak, paling tidak nyaman di pekerjaan. Untuk bisa mengembalikan produktivitinya paling tidak mendekati yang ideal. Demikian Pak, terima kasih. Baik, terima kasih Pak Gusti. Itu lebih ke sharing ya Pak ya. Memang uh, karyawannya dulu yang harus dijaga ya.
Okay. Is there any further question? At all sharing? What is the question? Well, I think it's a, it's a sharing, Caroline. It's a sharing okay, I'm from... sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Pak Yuri, kayaknya nggak ada lagi ya? Iya, Pak. Ya, sudah. Baik, kalau begitu barangkali uh, kita cukupkan sampai di sini, Bapak Ibu sekalian. Uh, terima kasih atas perhatian dan partisipasinya. So, tidak pula, I would like to express our gratitude. Thank you for special Thank to Caroline and Campbell, dan juga uh, Pak Yuri, Pak Apung, semuanya dari grup Daya Lima. Terima kasih atas sharingnya. It's very beneficial for us. Ini sangat bagus. Setidaknya kita membuka bahwa, ya kalau boleh jujur, it's really tough. Krisis ini beda dengan krisis-krisis sebelum. It's really, really tough. It's really, really tough. Dan ini perlu di manage dengan baik. Dan yang paling utama, yang prosperity-nya adalah we have to manage ourselves. Kalau saya boleh conclude begitu. As a leader, kita lah yang dahuluan harus memanage diri kita untuk bisa show up, memberikan, meyakinkan kepada terutama pasukan kita di lapangan. Gitu ya. Dan tipnya dari terakhir, dari conclusion yang disampaikan oleh Caroline, we should stay calm, confidence, Be clarity, caring, consistency, gitu ya. Tapi yang paling suka saya ujung-ujungnya, we have to stay, stay cool, stay calm, be tough. Barangkali itu yang harus kita laksanakan. Tidak, tidak mudah, tapi selama kita hand in hand with each other, kita selalu dalam kebersamaan, insya Allah seberat apapun masalah akan bisa kita atasi. Dan mudah-mudahan di tengah puasa hari pertama ini, insya Allah, doa kita bisa membantu, mengiringi, mudah-mudahan krisis ini segera cepat berlalu. Dari panitia, kami mohon maaf atas segala kekurangan dan tentunya sebagai bahan untuk kita sempurnakan pada penyelenggaraan webinar yang akan datang. Dan saya dapat pesan, kiranya kalau misalkan masih ada pesan untuk bisa di-share dalam konteks uh, topik ini atau pertanyaan lain bisa disampaikan, nanti bisa dijawab secara tertulis, gitu ya, teman-teman. Dan juga kalau pengen ngabuburit lagi seperti hari ini, karena ini ngabuburit, ngabuburit pertama dari agendanya Pak Alek Denny. Pak Alek, you still there? Ya. Pak Alek? Hadir, ya. kasih, Pak. Uh, barangkali kalau ada ingin share lagi, kita pengen ngabuburit bareng, kita curhat-curhatan lagi mengenai kondisi krisis ini, bisa disampaikan kira-kira topik apa yang ingin kita bahas. Apa sangat jarang, CEO, ada seberapa di sini? Ada ceritaan saya, ada 149 BUMN kumpul, ngobrol bareng, ngabuburit, bagaimana kita diskusikan masalah COVID ini. Barangkali itu yang bisa disampaikan sebagai uh, penutup dari kami. Barangkali uh, dari Pak Alek ada lagi yang ingin disampaikan? Cukup. Uh, terima kasih atas supportnya semuanya. Baik. Mohon maaf okay. uh, Pak Herdi, yeah. Pak Alex, kebetulan kita ada poll juga Pak untuk oh, yeah, uh, para ya, Bapak si apa, Bapak Ibu CEO uh, untuk saran uh, topik selanjutnya gitu. Bapak-bapak, Ibu, ada poll yang bisa tolong diisi. Saran selanjutnya ya. Belum tercatat dari tadi. Dan yang punya acara setelah itu mengatakan. Tunggu tegang pak. Cepat. Terima kasih ya. Banyak yang menanyakan tentang uh, mungkin crisis proof business strategy. 
dan juga leading change. Ya, itu mungkin nanti dua topik yang bisa kita consider uh, Pak Alex Dani, Pak Herdi okay. untuk topik selanjutnya, Pak. Baik, kalau begitu So, developing crisis proof business strategy and leading change during crisis moment ya. Itu topik uh, next yang mungkin kita sampaikan dalam kesempatan yang akan datang. Saya rasa demikian. Terima kasih sekali lagi buat segenap partisipan yang hadir pada yang ikut partisipasi pada kesempatan ini. Terima kasih wabillahi taufik wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Bapak-bapak dan Ibu semua. Thank you.